about uh, Dr. Stambaugh, uh, in whose honor this lecture is given. He was an ophthalmologist in Lexington, Kentucky for many years. He did his undergraduate as well as his, took his medical degree from the University of Louisville and trained in ophthalmology at the University of Cincinnati. And among the honors he received was election to Alpha Omega Alpha. Uh, Dr. Stambaugh's surgical skills were enhanced by his service in the Korean War, an experience he valued for developing his sense of compassion and his willingness to make an extra effort in ministering to his patients. Throughout his career, Dr. Stambaugh always was eager to apply new and innovative technology to his practice while never losing sight of the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of his patients. He enjoyed teaching and served on the voluntary faculty at the University of Kentucky. And during the later years of his professional life, which were extended by a heart transplant, Dr. Stambaugh became increasingly concerned about a variety of ethical issues, rapidly occurring changes in medicine, and the impact of societal changes on the medical profession and the welfare of individuals needing care. The Stambaugh family ensures that the ethical issues of importance to Dr. Stambaugh are addressed in the endowment of this lecture series. So we, we owe them a debt of gratitude. Um, before we go on to uh, my introduction to, of our speaker today, I wanted to let you know that all of our uh, talks are recorded and they are placed on the division webpage usually after about two to three weeks, but not only that, they are also placed on the gigantic server which uh, Apple Computer has for their iTunes University. So if you have a PC or a Mac, and you have iTunes, you can go to the free iTunes University portal. If you type in the search term Louisville Bioethics, it will take you to all three of our lecture series. And you can watch any of these lectures at any time. But very importantly, too, due to the wonderful industry of Andrea Sinclair, who is also our master's head mucky muck, she uh, has also put the, uh, the slides themselves so it gives you a great opportunity to see not only the speaker speaking, but the slides as well. So moving on to our speaker. Dr. Jack Coolahan is the Professor Emeritus of Preventive Medicine and Fellow of the Center of Medical Humanities and Bioethics at the Stony Brook University of Stony Brook, also known as SUNY Stony Brook in New York. He is the past director of the Division of Medicine and Society and the Institute of Medicine and Contemporary Society at Stony Brook until his retirement in 2007. Jack's poems and stories have appeared in literary magazines, medical journals in the United States, Canada, England, and Australia, and his works are widely uh, anthologized. I would tell you just very candidly, he is arguably the preeminent, preeminent physician poet of our time, even though he would probably be too humble to agree to that. He is the author of four collections of poetry, including <coughs> Medicine Stone in 2002, has authored or edited several other books, and the most recent of these is the fifth edition of the Medical Interview, Mastering Skills for Clinical Practice. A best-selling text also on the clinician-patient relationship and primary care and anthology of poems by physicians in primary care. Jack's honors and awards include fellowships from the Pennsylvania Council for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities, the American College of Physicians Poetry Award, the American Nurses Association Award for Best Book, the Merck Fellowship at Yaddo, and the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine Award for Distinction in the Humanities. Dr. Coolahan graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with both an MD and MPH and completed residencies in internal medicine and public health at the University of Pennsylvania, Wake Forest, and University of Pittsburgh. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jack Coolahan. Thanks, David, and uh, I'm very delighted to be here uh, today, and it's just a lovely day here in Louisville. I, I hear it's going to be stormy later, but uh, as far as uh, my experience so far, it's just been delightful. And thank you for coming out at noontime to, uh, to hear me talk. Today, I want to... Um, I want to forward arrow on the keyboard. Forward arrow on the keyboard. Um, no. there, we go. there we go. It's kind of a downward arrow. Uh, I'd like to begin today by talking about a case and um, what some of the things that I've learned from taking care of this patient. Um, 
This was a patient I saw in Pittsburgh many years ago when I was a general medicine consultant at Presbyterian Hospital there. And it was a Friday afternoon and I was called in by the surgical service to see a patient who they were convinced was having an alcohol withdrawal syndrome. And of course, since it was late Friday afternoon and he was having uh, agitation and hallucinations, they were anxious to get the medical service involved um, so they wouldn't have to bother with him on the weekend. And um, so I, I came to see that he, he was a, 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 a man who had come in for a cholecystectomy as a result of pancreatitis, which was thought to be due to a gallstone, but there was also the question that it might be alcohol induced. Uh, another aspect of his past medical history was that he was paraplegic from uh, polio when he was an adolescent. And after surgery, he had developed delirium and hallucinations and um, they thought, as I said, that he was having withdrawal. Now, of course, he said that he didn't drink, but y you could just take one look at the man, the surgical resident told me, and know that he was lying and that, in fact, he was an alcoholic. And that was because, uh, number one, he was poorly educated. Um, he used a lot of four-letter words. He was gruff. He talked back to the surgeons. And uh, the coup de grace was that he had a bad case of acne rosacea and he had a big red nose. And of course, he was in a wheelchair. So for all of those reasons, they were convinced that he was having alcohol withdrawal. So I went in to see him and uh, after he swore at me for a while, uh, I, I um, asked him if, uh, he would, if he'd like uh, some apple juice or something. And uh, he said yes, and I got him a, a carton of apple juice. And eventually we sat down and, and, and started talking. And uh, to cut to the chase here, it turned out that this patient was having a delayed anesthetic reaction which was the cause of his, uh, that was when we used halothane at the time. And um, he was having a delayed reaction and uh, that he actually wasn't drinking. But they had put him on Cirax and other medications that w had actually uh, caused him to be uh, kind of uh, un very uncomfortable and, and increased his anger. Later, after he was discharged, he became my, my patient. I treated him for his COPD and his hypertension. And every time he would come in, he would circle back to this experience that he had in the hospital. He said that his doctors didn't listen to him, that he was so angry that they just wouldn't listen and they had labeled him and uh, he, 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 he just couldn't get over it. And it went on for a while and I didn't know what I could do about it because I tried to explain to him this and that, but it, it, it just became an obsession with him. And so one time I, I went home and uh, one night I, I sat down and I wrote a, uh, a poem that, um, that tried to capture his voice and how he felt, or at least how I experienced he felt. And the title of the poem is, I'm going to slap those doctors. Because the rosy condition makes my nose bumpy and big, and I give them the crap they deserve, they write me off as a boozer and snow me with drugs. Like I'm going to go wild and green bugs are going to crawl on me and I'm going to tear out their goddamn precious IV. I haven't had a drink for years. But those slick bastards cross their arms and talk about sodium. 
they come in with their noses crunched up like my room is purgatory and they're the goddamn angels doing a bit of social work. Listen, I might not have much of a body left, but I've got good arms. The polio left me that. And the skin on my hands is about an inch thick. And when I used to drink, I could hit with the best in Braddock. Listen, one more shot of the crap that makes my tongue stop. And they'll have something on their hands they didn't know existed. They'll have time on their hands. They'll be spinning around drunk as skunks, heads screwed on backwards, and then Dr. Big Nose is going to smell their breaths, wrinkle his forehead, and spin down the hall in his wheelchair on the way to the goddamn heavenly choir. Well, so I, I wrote this poem and I, I took it in to him uh, and showed him the next time he came in to see me. And he was delighted. I mean, <laughs> I mean he, 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 it, was, it was amazing. It was like a conversion experience. And later on, when it came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, I brought that published version in to him. And uh, he folded it up and put it in his wallet. And for years, I'm talking about years, he carried this little piece of raggedy page in his wallet. And I'm convinced that though I took care of him for maybe 10 years after that, the most important medical treatment I ever gave that man was writing this poem and sharing it with him. And what did it do? Well, it attempted to give him a voice. It attempted to give him a voice. And he was able to relate to that because I had somehow sort of para somehow hooked on to the voice he would have had if he were able to e express it. But what I want to talk about now is not so much the therapy of the poem for Mr. B or uh, other patients, many other patients who uh, I think would benefit from empathy and connection. But I want to talk about the effect on the clinician, on the doctor or the other clinician who is attempting to connect with his or her patient in such a way that he is trying to understand what that patient is 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 experiencing and i want to i want to submit to you for the next half hour or so the proposition that empathy and i'm going to talk a little bit about empathy is a process which engages the moral imagination and that in trying to understand our patients we learn to understand ourselves better and that in fact we give ourselves a voice. And at Stony Brook our students in the third and fourth years have to write journals about parts of their clinical experience. Reflective journals. It's a reflective, para, a reflective practice exercise that they post on their e-portfolios. And um, although these quotes are not, strictly speaking, the, 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 the average or the, the typical uh, quotes, they are commonly, they, they, they express very commonly experienced feelings of students. For example, I can't believe how arrogant the residents and attendings are. It's all macho gamesmanship. If an emotion creeps into the situation, the uh, attendings deflect it away. So much of what I do is stuff I don't fully believe in. 
this is really sad. I have come to the realization that as a physician, I cannot give my patients what I as a patient wanted. This was my worst rotation. My preceptor at the Family Health Center was a big disappointment. She talks a good talk, but wait till you see her in action. I asked him if I should inform the nurse that the patient would need a shot of morphine to pre-medicate for pain, and the fellow said no. I was livid that he was going to subject this patient to such a painful procedure. It was so unnecessary. You know, these students are just beginning their career in medicine, but I think as they progress through their residencies and into their medical careers, I think like many of us, they feel relatively helpless to express their own voice. They, they tend to, they, 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 they're put in a situation in which they're surrounded by a certain culture, a certain standard voice of medicine. And the line of least resistance is to buy into it. Even if they don't want to buy into it, it's very difficult not to. And it reminds me of my own experience, maybe some years ago, when I was reading uh, The Inferno. Actually, it was soon after Shamas Haney's translation just came out. Uh, the beginning of the, the uh, Inferno. In the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself astray in a dark wood where the straight road had been lost sight of. How hard it is to say what it was like in the thick of thickets, in a wood so dense and gnarled, the very thought of it renews my panic. And I think there's much about medicine that is dense and gnarled. And there, there, there is a tendency in fact, I would say a, a, a cultural, almost a cultural demand that instead of facing up to the density and gnarledness of it, that we subsume it, that we take a step back from it and don't recognize that. You know, our patients can perceive some of the problems that exist in medicine, just like Mr. B. Poor communication, a sense that the doctor doesn't care, that he doesn't or she doesn't spend enough time with the patient, that they're detached and they don't listen. And I think that my students, you saw their journals, they also can see that happening, but they feel helpless really to, to do much about it. Of course, the students think that when they get to be attendings, they'll be able to do something about it. But of course, when they get to be attendings, they find themselves in the same context and they find themselves, or at least they believe themselves, equally powerless. You know, our great American physician poet, William Carlos Williams, in one of his late poems, Asphodel, That Greeny Flower, wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. That there's something about poetry, and I want to interpret his word poetry here to mean reflective, imaginative, ref uh, reflective, imaginative writing and thinking about one's experience. It's difficult to get the news from that, but men die every day for lack of what is found there. And I think our icon, our medical icon, Osler, tried to capture that in one of his essays where he said that there is nothing that will sustain you 
better in the humdrum routine of medicine than to recognize the poetry of life, the poetry of the commonplace. And I want to, to take those two thoughts and trace them back to a kind of stream of thought about the medical experience that stretches back a couple of hundred years about what it is like to become a physician and to practice as a physician. Now in the first book of medical ethics in the modern era, Thomas Percival published in 1803, he wrote that physicians should unite tenderness and steadiness in their care of patients and cultivate tender charity. Now, cultivate is an active word, okay? And so he's talking about it's something you need to do. It's part of the, a part of the process. You need to cultivate tender charity. And why is that? Because he, he says that the natural course of things in medicine is that you become vulnerable to coldness of heart. And this is a quote. This coldness of heart, this moral insensibility should be sedulously counteracted before it has gained an invisible ascendancy. To go back a generation beyond that, um, you have John Gregory, um, a professor at the University of Edinburgh, who writes that the chief quality of a physician's character is humanity or sensibility of heart that makes us feel for the distress of our fellow creatures. He goes on to say that that what is necessary, firmness of mind is, is necessary. You have to acquire firmness of mind, but a gentle and humane temper, so far from being inconsistent with vigor of mind, is its usual attendant. Moving forward into the middle of the 19th century, you have writers on medical education talking about the fact that the study of medicine has a manifest tendency to harden and corrupt the heart. And it has a peculiar tendency to harden the disposition. So, what do you do? You have to cultivate an affectionate, sympathetic, sympathizing spirit. Again, an active process. Osler then talks about cultivating, cultivating this sense of what he called equinematos without at the same time hardening the human heart. So the kind of received knowledge, the tradition, until relatively recently was a, an almost universal recognition that medicine does have these tendencies. The process, the substance of medicine, has the tendency to harden the heart, to corrupt the heart, to promote coldness of heart, and to foster moral insensibility. Okay? This is the received knowledge. The response to that by these medical philosophers and clinicians and educators was, okay, you need to cultivate tender charity. You need to cultivate an affectionate, sympathizing spirit. spirit. Unite tenderness with steadiness. Okay. Around the 1950s to 60s, a big change occurred. And <laughs> the philosophy at that point became, okay, yes, all of these things are true, suck it up. Okay, it's tough, it's tough, but you have to do it on yourself, by yourself. You, the, yes, you know, you, you go into medical training with these uh, goals, 
to become a compassionate physician, to become an idealistic carer, to be a healer. Those are great goals and we honor those goals and that's what you need to do. But that's natural. You know, just preserve those goals, that's good. What we need to do is to teach you more explicitly how to harden your heart and corrupt your heart and so forth. So that the, the, the response to this, to this problem is that we're not going to attend to it anymore in medical education. And so we've developed this myth of detachment which is the only way we can be objective and practice medicine effectively is to detach ourselves from our own feelings and those of our patients and uh, it's tough. It's tough to do that. So we need to steel ourselves against our natural inclinations and work hard to become firm and steady and we can do it because we're tough. The uh, a really extreme example of that and I, I grant you at the beginning this is an extreme example although I think some of you uh, may relate to it from other parts of your own experience comes from Hemingway's story Indian Camp where young Nick is camping with his father and his uncle and his father's the doctor and across the lake in the Indian Camp there's a young woman who's having a very difficult labor and she's been in labor for a couple of days and they send across to get Nick's father to help her deliver the baby and Nick goes with his father and she's there she's in bed she's screaming she's in agony she's in pain and Nick says oh daddy can't you give her something to make her stop screaming and, and uh, his father says no I haven't any anesthetic but her screams are not important. I don't hear them because they're not important. Now as I say it's an extreme example and not one that any of us or our colleagues would, would admit to but it's, it's the question of what do the screams represent and should we open ourselves up to the screams? is that somehow going to damage us and also damage our care of the patient. Cynthia Ozick wrote in one of her really <coughs> elegant essays, Metaphor and Memory, that physicians cultivate detachment nowadays because they are afraid of finding themselves too frail to enter into psychological twinship with the even frailer souls of the sick. So I think some of us at least, and I know it's true of myself, have found ourselves at times in medical practice feeling astray in a dark wood. And we're confronted with a culture that affects us in a way that tends to cultivate emotional numbness. I'm not saying a, a large percentage of us succumb to it. Uh, hopefully it's a, it's a relatively small percentage. But nonetheless it's a tendency to focus on detaching ourselves from our emotions in caring for patients which becomes a habit of our hearts and in general tends over time to make us more emotionally numb. And certainly this is nothing new. We all know that this is the onlog, the, the, the situation in which disillusion and burnout occurs. And that is a, is a dynamic that as you know is very common uh, in medicine today. Um, just the opposite kind of response going back to William Carlos Williams is his comments from his autobiography when he's talking about seeing his patients 
And, and rather than this detachment that is so prominent and so really orthodox in our, in our medical education today, he says, I lost myself in the very property of their minds. That the details of the case would formulate themselves and the patient would shape up into a person who called for attention. And he talks about, he goes on and talks about how revivifying it was that when he left his office hours, that willingness to open himself up and to see his patients as persons who called for attention, not just, you know, GI diseases and so forth, that gave him the peace of mind that comes from adopting the patient's perspective. And this brings us back to Mr. B and why I think writing the poem about Mr. B and many other poems I've tried to write uh, taking the voice of patients, um, somehow healed me, gave me a peace of mind or an insight that I didn't have before. Um, let me read you another poem. Um, and this one is called The Man with Stars Inside. And this was a patient who was dying of metastatic lung cancer. And he was on a morphine drip. And I was standing there beside his bed. And um, I wrote this poem. And actually, it was a poem that I wrote for his two daughters um, sometime after he died. Deep in this old man's chest, a shadow of pneumonia grows. I watch Antonio shake with a cough that traveled here from the beginning of life. As he pulls my hand to his lips and kisses my hand, Antonio tells me, for a man whose death is gnawing at his spine, pneumonia is a welcome friend, a friend who reaches deep between his ribs without a sound and puff a cloud begins to squeeze so delicately the great white image of his heart the shadow on his x-ray grows each time antonio moves each time a nurse smooths lotion on his back or puts a fleece between his limbs each time he takes a sip of ice from the moist chest shakes with cough, the shadow grows. In that delicate shadow is a cloud of gas at the galaxy's center. A cloud of cold, stunned nuclei beginning to spin, spinning and shooting a hundred thousand embryos of stars. I listen to Antonio's chest where stars crackle from the past and hear the boom of blue giants newly caught and the snap of white dwarves coughing and spinning. The second time Antonio kisses my hand, I, find, I feel his dusky lips reach out from everywhere in space. I look at the place his body was and see inside the stars. Now, we're going to have five minutes on science. And the question is, is empathy a feeling, an attitude, a thought process, or a turnip? You know, when I start, when I talk about this and, and we teach the question of connection, the question of attentive listening and of developing a connection with patients. First thing happens, Dr. Coulihan, can empathy be taught? You know? Well, 
we know that empathy is a natural human characteristic. And I've just included this um, to, to make the point that as we learn more about empathy and more about our neurological makeup, we've learned that there are different components to empathy, but that cognitive empathy, which develops in adolescence and early adulthood, the ability to take a pers perspective, others' perspective, to develop fertile imagination and a theory of mind, is certainly somehow attached to certain circuits in our brain. But of course, everything else we learn is somehow attached to certain circuits in our brain, which does not say we shouldn't have an educational system because our intelligence or our visual ability or so forth is somehow located <coughs> or hardwired in us. The, the idea that empathy is a kind of inborn, um, an inborn quantity that can't be changed or can't be altered re result, results from cultural bias and not from any understanding of the scientific um, human experience. So I, I'm, I'm just going to go past this very quickly, but I, I'm just putting it in to emphasize to you the idea that, that when I talk poetry, when I talk reflective practice, when I talk how we can educate medical students and residents in these areas, I am not ignoring the neurological bases or understanding of these factors any more than I'm ignoring that when I teach them physiology. What I'm saying here is that the road of detachment, which we began in the 1950s or so, leads to emotional numbness. And I think in our profession, we've had a healthy dose of emotional numbness creep upon us, whereas the road of empathy and developing the moral imagination leads to emotional resilience that allows us to take care of our patients with, as William Carlos Williams said, shapes them up into persons worthy of our attention. I want to uh, try to contrast those two views in a poem I wrote um, about an experience I had on the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation in uh, western South Dakota. And at that time I was there, I was on sabbatical and uh, doing some stuff and was invited to a sun dance. Now a sun dance is a healing ceremony which uh, is conducted in the summer and in which young, usually young people, but other times people who are facing that quandary that Dante described at the beginning of the Inferno, of feeling lost in a dark wood, that these people go through a process of fasting and uh, a very rigorous process involving dancing and a lot of it has to do with dancing in the sun. It's rather warm at the time. And eventually they reach a point where they feel like they're about to get in touch with their, what they're looking for. And in general, what they're looking for is their animal totem that, that kind of characterizes their spirit. In other words, gives them the voice that they're looking for. They're looking for the voice. They're looking for a voice. And at that point, they attach themselves on a, as you can see, 
by their chest to a kind of a maypole thing and dance around it and eventually tear away from it and reach a kind of um, hallucinatory, we would call it a hallucinatory experience in which they come into touch with that totem which gives them the voice. But part of this is when the bystanders uh, who are standing around, you know, gaping at this, um, are invited to pick up a stone uh, and to have that stone blessed by the dancers and the medicine men. And by having that stone blessed, that it would have some healing power that you can take with you away from this ceremony. And so I did this and got the stone and went through this and put the stone in a little pouch and I carried it with me, still carry it with me in my briefcase, which I don't have with me here. Uh, but in any case, uh, I got to thinking about this stone and what it meant when I returned to the city. And so I, I wrote this poem called Medicine Stone. This stone I picked at a medicine dance on a cold June day at Wounded Knee. In my bare feet I carried this stone into the circle of those with need. A sun dancer danced in front of me, touched my shoulder with a sprig of sage. A sun dancer chanted in front of me and blessed me with his medicine pipe. Here in the city, the sky is brilliant. I carry this stone in a buckskin pouch. Here in the city, we suffer in private. Each of us stands in the circle alone. This stone is an aspect of soul that lasts. This stone is a remnant of no account. Here in the hospital, Coyote is dead. This small stone is of no account. Wolves, spiders, moles, snakes, ants are dead. This spherical stone is of no account. Eagles, hummingbirds, ravens, bats are dead. This stone is a remnant of no account. Only the voices of suffering live. The skin and what happens beneath the skin. Still, I carry this buckskin pouch and a small stone wrapped in a wad of sage. This stone is an aspect of soul that lasts. I call it my friend, my black stone friend. The question is, is poetry or reflective writing or reflection an aspect of soul that lasts or is it a remnant of no account? I have found that the road of empathy and the moral imagination leads to uh, really a, a renewed passion for medicine and a renewed passion for my work. And I try to communicate this to students and that as you can see here that at the end, at the end my guide and I set out on that hidden path to make our way into the bright world again. He first and I second. When I could see the rounding opening, the night sky with the beautiful things it carries, and so we came out and we looked at the stars. And I think so many of us who are now disillusioned with medicine and feel that there's not much we can do because the system is so screwed up and it's so complicated and we're so downtrodden could do that it's not a universal prescription that guarantees anything but certainly it's a prescription 
that improves our standard, improves our quality of life. I want to end this talk with a poem that I wrote for um, the graduating class at Stony Brook in 1994. They asked me to write a poem uh, on their graduation to, to recite at their commencement. And um, so I wrote this poem called Turning the Page. And it has to do with a vision of ourselves and our, the arc and the, the texture of our lives. Turning the page. This is not the end. It's where the story takes a twist. Like when your palms turned moist on being sent to see the ill, not just with eyes, but with your heart as well. It's where the tale takes an unexpected turn, a turn you might have expected, but not exactly now. Slogging through the wilderness of words you've searched for years, you find the track your quarry left. It's near. It's where the hero comes, of course, galloping high across the page, and where you find the hero's name is yours. This is not the end. It's where the champion charges in to kill the dragon, save the day. She doesn't fail. This is the page where you come in to tell the tale. Thank you. So we have time um, for questions. And I'd really appreciate any comments or thoughts you might have uh, on these matters. Especially if you disagree, because that's, you know, that's good. Yes. Thank you for your comments. I'd just like to add that uh, intellect, intellectualization is often used as a way of uh, not seeing the needs of the patient and ascribing it to a neurological or a psychiatric problem, which implies that the patient is actually not suffering. Yes. Repeat the question. So the, the question is that, or the comment really, is that uh, students and young doctors often use intellectualization as a technique to kind of understand the situation by categorizing it into a neurological or some kind of problem and essentially saying that they're not really suffering. Is that it? For professors as well. Like and professors as well, yeah. I, yeah. The older I get, the more I refer to young people. Uh, yes? The ability of doctors to deal with a patient has something to do with his upbringing and his culture? Yes. Because where I came from, we don't encounter this kind of attitude of physician. You don't, where you come from, you don't encounter? I go up in the Philippines. Yes. And you don't encounter? It's unacceptable. In other words, it's in the Philippines, it's unacceptable to feel detached and not care, uh, not show your care for your patients. And I think I think that is uh, that's true. You know, we talk about integrating medical humanities into our medical education these days, and. Um, I think a fair criticism, somebody who was historically conscious, might say to you, might say in response, well, wait a second, back in those days when you were quoting uh, those writers from the 19th or 20th centuries uh, who were talking about the importance of these qualities in doctors, they didn't have humanities in their medical schools then either. So why are you wanting to introduce it now? Well, the point is that we've had a, a re sea change in our culture. Um, 
it, in those days, a person coming into medical school was expected as an educated person to have a broad knowledge of the humanities and of the qualities. And there was kind of a commonly accepted culture of understanding character and virtue as kind of the basis of our culture. And I think this is true in other cultures as well. Nowadays, we have students coming into medical schools who have not been exposed, who, who are immersed in a culture that does not value these humane qualities and who have gone through an education in which studying them or learning about them uh, is not required. I mean, you can get your, M, your degree in biochemistry without ever having had any exposure to the humanities. Um, so the problem now is that we're faced with a very difficult task since it, it to some extent our promotion of the human qualities of medicine and our recognition of the power of the word, the power of the interaction to heal is countercultural because in our country people are not acknowledging that. Well, yes? I think the difference in medical education, my father and grandfather knows, there was a great deal of contact with the older professor or one-on-one. -on -one. It, it was like law for a while was taught not in schools. And it, it came to where you, you well, I can determine you get a get an A in organic chemistry and be 21 years of age and no life experience. My fun in medical school was when when I got to move on with, with the, the physician like uh, Dr. Harkness who was from Edinburgh who was a renaissance and the pulmonary specialist who worked in eastern Kentucky and found that he needed to come and mm -hmm. help the medical school students. Right. So that and it's, it's, very, it's very easy. You can, I, I saw generations put in there. Empathy was, was, came on early on in medicine. And if you sit down and listen to the patient instead of having the medical school write up and work up your, the guy you're going to operate on, they become your friends and consequently they open up to you and give you the answers. Yeah. Okay. So the, the comment was that uh, in the past, uh, young medical trainees were exposed for long periods of time in a kind of apprenticeship relationship with mentors uh, and they could develop that relationship with them and at the same time see how to develop their relationships with patients to reflect the experience with their, with their mentors. And I think a second part of what you were saying was because of the, con the continuity of these experiences that added the dimension of, of their being more or less friends. Um, I think you're precisely right. Um, one of the difficulties of our medical system, uh, you know, uh, amongst this whole basket of problems, I think, is that the, although we pay lip service to the kind of mentoring that is supposed to occur on clinical clerkships and so on, we have fragmented that training just as much as we've fragmented the patient's uh, treatment. And so uh, students don't have um, attendings, you know, attendings are just a short period of time or they don't have teaching rounds that often or the attending is busy doing something else. So there's not these sustained relationships. Moreover, the, the, the relationships that they do have tend often, at least where I come from, to be with physicians who are really more interested in 
uh, their particular procedure or their particular subspecialty or their research than they are actually in the patients. And so that is a kind of negative uh, mentoring. Uh, that's we see a whole lot of, uh, you know, the guy you're ahead of you or somebody ahead of you, and there's no wisdom in the guy when you're ahead of you, especially when, I mean, I was 30 before I started medical school, and I, I've done a whole lot of things in life that okay. allowed me to, to and contradict the guy ahead of me when he said he needed to deliver biopsy, and I'd say, well, the results are not making a difference, and the guy said, you signed the permit. I said, that's no presence of the liver, no reason for the liver. Well, see, that's what... Sometimes I would over that, but I would stick to my guns and then prove to be the right thing. Okay, David? I'm going to ask a different question. You have a lot of students in the audience, and I'd like to ask you, how did you begin writing poetry? What was it that spurred you to start doing it? And what was the... What was the means by which that you did this? Then, mm -hmm. sort of the breaking of the glass. Mm -hmm. I think we all have. Uh, I think getting back to the idea of finding a voice. Um, in my case, I had always had this passion, I would say, for writing and particularly for poetry. I used to write in college and high school and so forth. And I really did, in my practice and in my life, in the mid-1980s, experience I, the kind of thing I described with Dante in the middle, being in the middle of a dark wood and not knowing where to turn. And it's at that time that I turned to poetry. Um, I actually, it was a patient uh, who of mine who was a poet who, who kind of stimulated me kind of the, 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 the thing that kind of pushed me over the top into finally saying you know I am not going to stand for spending more years telling myself that I'm going to be a creative writer that I want to write poetry but isn't it too bad that I'm too busy and I have too many patience to see and too much to do that I can't do it. I said, I, you know, life's too short for that. So that kind of tipped me over the edge and said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to work at it. You know, I, I'm a doctor. I have discipline. I'm going to work <laughs> and become a practicing poet. And I did. And I think that too often as physicians, we are cowed into thinking that we're just too busy. We're, you know, we've got too much to do. And too, without taking a step back and reflecting on what's important and what this is doing to us. Sure, we're concerned about our patients. Maybe not understanding sometimes how to be better concerned about our patients. But but oftentimes we don't understand how this dynamic of detachment affects us and affects our view, our kind of vision of what we could do, how we could find our voice, how we could change the system, improve our lives, improve the lives of our patients in ways that you know, are not immediately apparent. Yes. Um, you said that you have your students do reflective journals. Yes. Um, do you incorporate poetry or art in any other ways into the curriculum, and um, are your students receptive? Uh, the question is, uh, we do reflective journals. Do we incorporate poetry or art in, it, in our curriculum? Uh, unfortunately, we, we do not do visual art at, at, at Stony Brook, at least not as a required course. Uh, but we do incorporate poetry in both our first and second year courses, uh, which are medical humanities courses that are focused really on core skills of, of doctoring. Uh, and we encourage reflection, you know, we, we encourage students who wish to write poems, for example, as, you know, in their reflective journals to do so, and, and some do, you know. 
I mean, like poetry is not uh, a kind of a universal love of people, but that's okay. That's okay. Yes? Well, it's, I, I'm, tr I'm looking at the, <clears throat> the timing of the switch between uh, concern for humanities and uh, suck it up. And prior to, and this is, this is not going to be a nice clean divide, but if you look at Osler uh, and Percival, they're, they're classically trained mm -hmm. uh, because they are educated, at least moderately wealthy, uh, men of the day. And that's how you were educated. And then we look 1950s, 1960s, what's uh, wh where this sea change you, you're, you're talking about comes in. Well, what, what ties that in? The only thing I can think of that's, that's significant in the right time is the GI Bill, um, which brings in many more people into college. But I'm not sure how that would uh, translate to the sea change. So do you know where the, the, the change, why the change occurred, when it did? Um, I'm not a historian. I have, so the question is why did we medical education switch from a concern with these values to suck it up? And uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, one factual thing was that in the mid-1950s, a guy named uh, Howard Becker and his colleagues published a book called Boys in White. And in Boys in White, He's a sociologist and they, they studied medical students and they found this peculiar thing which they identified as detached concern. And in this book, it was described as a phenomenon that they had observed that students in medical schools appear to be uh, developing a, um, an attitude of detached concern toward their patients and their experiences seem to facilitate that. Uh, it's a sociological observation. Interestingly, as the late 50s and 60s developed, the medical education establishment took that uh, uh, observation and turned it into a normative value and said that detached concern is the appropriate stance that doctors ought to take toward their patient. And all of this coincided with the development of uh, technology, specialization, and so forth, which I think really became the core of medicine. Likewise, you had, instead of having practitioners who taught medical schools part-time, you had full-time physicians who were primarily clinician scientists and, and so forth. Yes, last question. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm sure I have two questions. I wonder if it's just coincidence or is there a relationship with the increased admittance of women into medical school in the late 60s onward and until they got to a certain number, uh, it then became popular or it became recognized that empathy. Uh, um, well, the, the, the question is uh, the, the, the effect of the increased uh, enrollment of, of women in medical schools. I think it's been dramatic. I think it really took off in the 80s and 90s and now of course over half of medical students around the country are, are women, I believe, over half, at least certainly every year at Stony Brook. Uh, uh, I think it's been very beneficial um, in terms of, of you know, and, and studies repeatedly show that, that um, you know, women prescribe fewer sedatives and, you know, have more, you know, more empathic behaviors than, physicians, than male physicians in the groups that have been studied. And I think this is going to be a, a, a benefit to medicine. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think women can be corrupted just as much as men, and I think that has also occurred. My last question was, who are the two gals in the <laughs> Oh, uh, two, two graduating students. I was thinking of the two daughters of Mr. B. They said you wrote your first poem. Oh, the, the, no, the, they're not. 
uh, the, the, the two, but I did refer to the two daughters of the man who died, Antonio, the man who died, and I had written that stars inside poem and gave it to those daughters uh, during their bereavement. Yeah. Thank you again Thank very you. much.